And so, ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me to welcome Dr. Randy Eichland. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to present my work here to the, today. Uh, it's about uh, European urobiliosis and uh, long time follow up. Uh, first time I presented, uh, one of the first times that I presented this uh, work was on um, eyelids in Philadelphia some years ago, so some of you have heard it before. And um, English is not my mother tongue, so I have to have my papers with me. I'm um, a part of a research group at Sarlan Hospital and we have been doing research on uh, tick-borne diseases for several years. Uh, I'm also a neurologist and I'm today happy to hear that neurologists are welcome in this uh, group of experts because in Norway we have uh, discussed that maybe this is a disease for the infectious uh, medicine people and um, but I think uh, neurologists are important uh, to, uh, to do research and to, to treat patients uh, with, with this uh, disease. So, um, your, I think some, could somebody help me here? Because I, this is uh, unfamiliar to me. It's not what I usually have at home. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so, um, no, uh, the acute uh, symptoms of uh, Lyme borreliosis are well treated with antibiotics. No, I mean the paresis, the sensory disturbances, uh, the lymphocytes in the CSA, uh, in the spinal fluid, um, the the features of the Banward syndrome. Despite this, we know that some of the patients are not getting well. Uh, in previous studies, we found that 10 to 50 percent of the patients did complain of uh, fatigue, cognitive problems, and neurological symptoms months and years after the treatment. Uh, so, we also know that uh, we have no evidence that repeated and prolonged antibiotic treatment does help for this condition. Uh, I say this also because uh, la this, this year, uh, last year, the Swedish um, Council on Technology and Assessment did uh, do a very good review on all the art articles published on this domain, uh, treatment in the acute phase and in the uh, chronic phase uh, or in the post-Lyme phase and found that the studies are not good enough to tell us does it help to treat or doesn't it help to treat. Um, but what we know and what I'm very happy about uh, it has been stressed during these uh, sessions that the side effects are considerable. So what we did, go with you all. Yeah. Um, we did a treatment study between 2004 and 2008 to see if um, the patients will be, um, will, which treatment could be the best one, ceftriaxone or doxylan uh, per orally. And when we finished the study after one year, or we, we were planning to finish, 50% of the patients told us, no, we are, not, we are not well. So we asked them, what's the problem? And we decided to do a follow-up 30 months after the treatment and to see uh, what kind of problems they had. And then we uh, choose uh, upon what the patients were complaining about to look into quality of life, fatigue and cognitive problems, and uh, of course also neurological uh, deficits. 
because we didn't test it this at start from the study, uh, we did have to have a control group. And because neurocognitive uh, assessments are depending on um, uh, education level and age, uh, we also uh, we did ask the patients to bring a matched control that would match for gender, education level, and for um, age. The only exclusion criteria for this uh, South Norwegian uh, uh, control group was that they didn't have a history of former uh, Lyme neuroboliosis. So then the assessments we chose for quality of life was the SF36 uh, with the, the physical composite score and the mental composite score is very often used in studies. For depression, uh, the um, models uh, for fatigue, so fatigue severity scale, apathy, SAS uh, uh, questionnaire. We did an uh, exam, clinical exam, neurological examination at every visit. And we made also a score where we combined the clinical uh, status with the subjective complaints. And we did spinal fluid and blood taps. So here are also the neuropsychological assessments that we did. I can go into details uh, about this, but you will have the mail address afterwards where you can, or the address where you can see the whole study. Uh, but it's um, one test for attention and executive functions, uh, trail making test and the Stroop test. Uh, for processing speed um, and visual memory, digit symbol and, and uh, trail making test five, verbal learning, the, verb, the California verbal learning test. And we also made a neuropsychological score where we did count how many of these 23 subtests for these four main tests. Uh, the patients did poorer than one standard deviation from the mean in the control group. It's called a set, uh, set score. And, and we were counting how many of these tests and, and made this neuropsychological score. So here is the time axis, how we did the um, study. So at the uh, treatment start um, and inclusion, we did uh, an interview, neurological examination, spinal, spinal and blood tap. And this was repeated at 4, 12 and 30 months visit. And at the 30 months visit, we were also doing the neuropsychological testing and use the questionnaires for quality uh, of life, depression and apathy. So uh, here are the diagnostic criteria and they meet the um, European guidelines on definite and um, possible neuroboliosis, so you have to do a spinal tap. And here are the patient's characteristics before they were treated. They were 53 years in average. Uh, there were mainly males, also 58% males. Uh, only 60% did remember a tick bite and only 22% did remember a rash. They had a symptom duration of 9.2 weeks before treatment. 80% of them had this typical uh, Banwert syndrome and just four of them had um, uh, signs and symptoms uh, that uh, made us think of an affection of uh, the brain or the spine as the central nervous system. So it's a small portion, and I think that's quite uh, representable for our region. Um, here are some of the results. Uh, it's based on these three articles. Um, this is the 30 months follow-up data. Uh, so they have been published between uh, 2010 and 12. Here are the neurological findings at 30 months. You can see that uh, uh, as much as uh, 14 patients did have um, mild neurological findings, like respirasis, paresthesia, uh, and things uh, like that. But that was not their main complaint. Their main complaint was the subjective something, symptoms, like fatigue, memory, and attention problems in 19 of the patients. So then we looked at quality of life compared to the matched group of patients. Uh, there was a significant uh, difference on the SF36 for both the physical and the mental quality of life. The patient scored lower. 
And here are more um, results. Fatigue uh, was a significant different, and you can see depression was also significant different from the groups. But uh, if you are, uh, you, you know this matters score, you can see that the points are so low that depression was no problem among the South Norwegian population or the patients. So um, apathy was also different in the two groups, but if you looked into significant apathy, uh, there, were no, there were no different between the groups. So from these um, assessments, fatigue is the most important thing to look at. So here you see a box plot uh, illustration of the fatigue um, distribution from the scores from the fatigue severity scale. And um, what it tells us is the first col column there with the patients that uh, there are significant more uh, patients in the in the group of significant fatigue, over four on the score, and also um, scoring more than five on the scores. Um, there are 16% of the controls also complaining about uh, uh, fatigue, and I think that's important, but when people talk about my study, they say that 50% of the patients did have complaints, but 60% of the patients does also have complaints. So this is uh, statistics. So, uh, it, but it's more patient without, uh, with, without doubt. And uh, also in the group with severe fatigue, there are two patients, but they have other disabling disease like a chronic cluster headache and a post-polio syndrome known to also cause fatigue. But these are average people. So here are the results from the neuropsychological tests. Um, and uh, then we can see that uh, the four red arrows are pointing on the test that was significantly different from patients and controls. Um, th these are the difference from the mean in the control group, how much poorer or better the patient scored from the mean in the control group. And you can see there's two tests where the patient scored better than the controls and they are not uh, significant. So, so all, or, all over the patients are scoring worse in one uh, test for executive function, one for process speed, processing speed, for one for visual and one for world, verbal memory. So what does, does this mean? Does that mean that uh, all the patients are scoring a little bit worse? Or does it mean that some subgroup of the patients are scoring worse, uh, substantially worse, um, giving them an impairment uh, in neuropsychological functioning? So then we had to look into the data in a different way, and uh, we uh, took this global neurological, uh, neuropsychological score that I told you about and counted the bad scores in uh, the patient group uh, and the patient group uh, and the control group, and made uh, four different uh, categories where the green is uh, where they scored normal, deficit six to eight uh, test scores uh, worse, and impairment nine to twenty. 23 poor test scores. And then we made a um, um, column diagram to show that the, the first column is the patients and the second is the controls. And what we can see that there are no difference, significant difference between the, the patients and the control scoring normal or with a deficit. But in the group of impairment, there is a significant uh, difference. One patient uh, scored uh, 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 so low, had so low scores that we could call it an impairment, and eight patients. And the one control with um, so low scores, uh, we think uh, it, he, he was uh, developing an uh, Alzheimer's disease. So uh, here is something going uh, on. We also looked at the risk factors and found that if you have symptoms more than six weeks before treatment, or you have a more severe uh, disease before treatment, or you are not getting well at four months, then uh, you have uh, a greater risk to have um, complaints also 30 years, uh, 30 years, 30 months after treatment. Now I wanted to uh, show you the spinal fluid findings 30 months after treatment. Uh, we did unfortunately not have the chance to look into this in more than 29 patients because of um, accident at the lab. But uh, we found that one patient had um, a raised cell count uh, at 30 months. And this patient had a new infection with a Borrelia. I could tell you a lot about that, but we did a new treatment and this uh, science disappeared. And 
But you, what you can see making it difficult for us is that it's still a high protein level in uh, one third of the patients. Uh, the anti-Borrelia antibody production is still there in 61% of the patients, and the only clonal, clonal bands are also there. Uh, but we didn't find any signs of uh, persistent infection in our study in the way it was designed. And we also did, find, did not find any associations between the spinal fluid findings and uh, the results of the tests we, uh, we did do. So uh, I'm standing here with the same conclusion. Uh, for me, it's several solutions uh, to this uh, problem, why some of the patients uh, didn't get well. And I think that one of, the, one of the things we have been really looking into is this uh, continuing uh, persisting infection, what we have been using almost or very much of our time here to talk about, uh, is just one and maybe the least uh, possible reason for the complaints. Uh, so um, I are missing some of my research colleagues here, <laughs> but maybe next time. So in conclusion, most uh, patients treated for Lyme borreliosis do get well. Also from neurological disease, I can't understand these numbers from yesterday that uh, if you have um, uh, ju just 9% uh, of, the, of the patients uh, treated with uh, ceftriaxone got uh, well, uh, uh, because most of our patients did get well, even they were quite sick, some of them. They all had uh, neurological diseases. Um, they, uh, some of them get reduced quality of life, fatigue and cognitive, 30 months after treatment. And uh, if you have um, symptoms for a long, more than six weeks uh, before treatment and, and a more severe treatment, uh, disease, you, har you har um, have more um, chance to get uh, problems uh, at 30 months with cognition and fatigue and uh, also quality of life. So, oh, so I think I thought that was the slide, I, but you, that's what we are talking about. There are many possible explanations. And here are the pictures of me trying to find some ticks behind the hospital. <laughs> so, uh, and here you can download my thesis if you want to. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you.